Hello everybody, my name is Iman. Welcome back to my YouTube channel. Today we're going to be discussing Gibbs energy. Now, so far in our course, we've discussed the first law of thermodynamics, which discusses energy balance, and we've also covered the second law of thermodynamics, which helps us decide which processes can occur spontaneously. Now, we may reasonably expect that we have enough thermodynamic quantities to deal with any situation. And while that expectation might be true in principle, the equations that we have derived so far in our class are not the most convenient to apply. With what we know from the laws of thermodynamics and our conversations on enthalpy and entropy so far, in this lecture, what we're going to do is introduce an important thermodynamic quantity. All right, this thermodynamic quantity is Gibbs energy. All right. And we're going to build up the motivation um, for what Gibbs energy is and why we want to formulate an expression for Gibbs energy. So the question we want to pose to introduce this topic is, well, how can we decide or figure out the spontaneity of a reaction? Gibbs energy, often denoted as G, is the key to answering this question about spontaneity. The equation for Gibbs energy is one that you might have seen in general chemistry and you might be for familiar with the format, right? Gibbs energy equals enthalpy minus temperature multiplied by entropy, all right? It's an expression that involves enthalpy, which we've covered, entropy we've talked about, and temperature. Now, what we wanna do is take what we know from the previous lectures and work up a derivation to this expression that we might be familiar with from general chemistry. And one of the motivations for this is, well, because we are generally interested only in what happens in the system, and we're not so much concerned with the events in the surroundings, you know, in our discussion thus far, about thermodynamics, about physical chemistry, it would be simpler if we could establish some criteria for equilibrium and spontaneity in terms of the change in a certain thermodynamic function of the system and not of the entire universe. So what we want to do is consider a system that is in thermal equilibrium with its surroundings at some temperature T. All right. Now, a process occurring in the system results in the transfer of an infinitesimal amount of heat. We're going to denote that dq from the system to the surroundings. All right, so that's our setup. And what that means, all right, what that means here that's really important is that minus dq of our system is equal to dq of our surroundings. And that means we can set up the following expressions, all right? The total change in entropy, all right, we can write as the change in entropy of the universe is equal to the change in entropy of our system plus the surroundings, and that has to be greater than, zero, greater than or equal to zero based off of our second law of thermodynamics, all right? Now, we have an expression for our change in entropy for the surroundings, all right, we can go ahead and replace that as dq surroundings over t, but we did just establish based off of our scenario that dq surroundings equals minus dq system, so we can go ahead and replace this term with this term. And so we get this following expression right here. All right, now note that every quantity on the right side here, all right, this part right here, all right, refers to the system now. We've been able to change a couple of variables, and now we have that the change in entropy of our universe is equal to the change in entropy of our system minus dq system over t, and that's all greater than or equal to zero. All right? And that was, as we started, considering a system in thermal equilibrium with its surroundings at temperature t, and we said that the process occurring in the system results in the transfer of an infinitesimal amount of heat from the system to the surroundings. All right, now if the process was taking place at constant pressure, all right, if that was the case, then what we can write is that dq system equals dh of the system, change in the enthalpy of the system. So we can replace this term 
with dh system. All right, and so we have the following expression now. Cool. The second thing that we want to do here is multiply this equation by minus t. When we do that, all right, when we do that, what we get is we're multiplying this whole part by minus t. All right, so now we have minus t multiplied by ds system. We have minus t multiplied by minus dh system over t. All right, and we do this to both sides. All right, and when we multiply by this negative number, this equality sign switches. All right, and now what we have is dh of system, right? Because minus dh system over t multiplied by minus t, we get rid of the negative sign, we get rid of the t. So this term because d becomes dh system minus t ds system, right? Because we're also multiplying this with this variable as well. And that is all less than or equal to zero. All right, we're going to now define a function. All right, we're going to define a function now that's called Gibbs energy. And you might have heard it previously referred to as Gibbs free energy or just free energy. Um, IUPAC, however, has recommended that the, that the free be dropped. All right, so it's more commonly referred to now as Gibbs energy. All right, we can now define an equation based off of this relationship right here, change in enthalpy of the system minus T, change in the entropy of the system. All right, we're going to define this as Gibbs energy. And so now what we can write is Gibbs is equal to enthalpy minus T entropy, temperature multiplied by entropy. And what we can see here is, well, because enthalpy, temperature, and entropy are all state functions, Gibbs is also a state function. And just like enthalpy, Gibbs has a unit of energy. All right. Now, <clears throat> at constant temperature, the change in the Gibbs energy of the system in an infinitesimal process can be written as change in the Gibbs of the system, dg system, equals the change in the enthalpy of the system minus T multiplied by the change in the entropy of the system. All right. And we can also apply, all right, that DG system that the change in Gibbs as a criteria for equilibrium and spontane spontaneity. We can set this criteria, all right, as a frame of reference for equilibrium and spontaneity. And so we can say, all right, when the change in Gibbs, the change in Gibbs energy of a system is less than or equal to zero, all right, that we're going to refer to that as spontaneous, all right? And when it is positive, then that refers to non-spontaneous reaction. And from now on, unless otherwise indicated, we're only going to consider the system in our discussion of Gibbs energy. All right. And so for this re for this reason, we might not be writing system all the time here for the rest of the lecture. All right. And what we can also write now is that for a finite isothermal process going from point one to point two, the change of Gibbs energy can be written as delta G equals delta H minus T delta S. All right. Now. The, con the conditions of equilibrium and spontaneity, as we've defined here, all right, at constant temperature and pressure are the following, just so that we are clear. When delta G is equal to zero, the system's at equilibrium. When delta G is less than zero, then the process is spontaneous. And if the delta G for a process is greater than zero, then it is not spontaneous all right let me rephrase when delta g is negative we call this process an exergonic reaction all right in other words you can think of this as a work producing reaction all right and that means it's spontaneous all right so negative delta g that's a process that that means this process is exergonic work producing and that also means that the process is spontaneous when delta g is positive all right, we call this process endergonic work consuming. All right, and in, in a positive delta G means that the process is not spontaneous. 
The important thing to also consider regarding this equation right here is that this equation applies to any process as long as the temperature and pressure are the same in the initial and final states. Now, the big question is, all right, why is Gibbs energy useful? Well, it's useful because it incorporates both enthalpy and entropy. In some reactions, the enthalpy and the entropy contributions, they reinforce each other. For example, if delta H is negative, all right, delta H negative, that means it's an exothermic reaction, and delta H was, and, and delta S was positive, then the process is favored, all right, moving from left to right, whatever that reaction might be, because if delta H is negative and delta S is positive, Gibbs delta G is always going to be negative for this kind of process. All right. It's always going to be, uh, um, it's always going to be, I'm sorry, let me rephrase. It will always be negative. Delta G will always be negative. So this re kind of reaction will always be spontaneous. All right. In other reactions, though, enthalpy and entropy, they may work against each other. All right. And we're going to see examples of that when we cover this table right here, factors affecting delta G of a reaction. All right. So let's look at this, right? Because we now have a formulation for Gibbs energy, and that's delta G is equal to delta H minus T delta S. All right. So if we you know, what, what is delta G going to look like when we have different signs associated with delta H and delta S? All right, well, let's analyze different scenarios so that we can understand all the factors that affect delta G of reaction. We can start off first with what does delta G look like when delta H is positive and delta S is also positive? All right, well, if delta H is positive, all right, and delta S is positive, here's something to consider. Delta H is positive, delta S is also positive. This whole term, though, minus T delta S is negative as a whole. And so what you really have contributing to delta G is one positive term and one negative term. And here's the thing to keep in mind. What determines whether delta G is positive or negative is the temperature at this point. At low temperatures, the T delta S term might be smaller than the delta H term. And that will make delta G positive. So that would be non-spontaneous. But at high temperatures, all right, at high temperatures, that T delta S term can become larger than delta H, making delta G negative therefore that refers to a spontaneous process all right so when delta h is positive and delta s is negative it depends on the temperature to 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 determine the sign that is associated with delta g delta g delta g is positive at low temperatures and negative at high temperatures for this particular scenario fantastic now what about when delta H and delta S are both negative. So we did a scenario where they're both positive. Let's do a scenario when they're both negative. So if delta H is negative, all right, delta S is negative. That means this whole term minus T delta S, all right, is going to be positive because negative times negative equals positive. Now, again, we have two terms, one that is negative and one that is positive. What determines the sign of delta G is how high the temperature is or how low the temperature is all right so when both of them are negative all right at low temperatures at low temperatures that t delta s term might be smaller in magnitude than delta h and that would make that negative term be a bigger contributor to delta g and that means at low temperatures delta g would be negative in this scenario all right, that means that, that that's spontaneous. But at high temperatures, that T delta S term can become larger in magnitude than delta H, which means that the positive value is predominant. All right, and that would make delta G positive 
at high temperatures, non-spontaneous. And so when both delta H and delta S are negative, the reaction might be spontaneous at low temperatures, but it becomes non-spontaneous at high temperatures, which is written right here. All right, two more scenarios we can cover here. All right, we're gonna cover all four scenarios. All right, what about when delta H is positive, all right, and delta S is negative? Well, if delta S is negative, this whole term, minus T minus S, this becomes positive. Now we have two positive terms, all right? No matter what, delta G is always going to be positive when enthalpy is positive and entropy is negative, all right? That's written right here, positive, positive at all temperatures, all right? And then for the last scenario, what if delta H was negative and delta S was positive? All right, if delta S was positive, this whole term is negative. We have two negative terms. Delta G will always be negative at all temperatures for that scenario. All right, so we've covered all of the different factors and all the different scenarios that could affect the delta G of a reaction. Now, with all that being said, all right, you might still be wondering what the meaning of Gibbs energy really is. Well, the Gibbs equation, it provides us with an extremely useful criteria for dealing with direction of spontaneous change and also the nature of chemical and physical equilibria. In addition, what it also does is it enables us to determine the amount of work that can be done in a given process. And in order to really understand that, all right, and in order to dive into this, we have to look into a couple of relationships. All right, we're going to have to look into a couple of relationships. And to do that, we write our Gibbs energy formula to begin with. So we're going to write G equals H minus, uh, minus TS, this equation right here. All right, we're starting off with our definition of G. We're going to say for an infinitesimal process, what we can write is we can write DG is equal to, right? So we can, DG is equal to DH minus DTS. And this expands into minus TDS minus SDT. All right, and so now we have this formula for an infinitesimal process. DG equals DH minus TDS minus SDT. Now, let's pause there in, 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 in relation to this definition. All right, one thing we notice in this definition is that there's a DH. All right, change in enthalpy. We know something about that. We've covered, we've covered enthalpy in great detail in our previous lectures. Let's go ahead and pause and let's write out our enthalpy formulation. H equals U plus PV, right? And Enthalpy equals internal energy plus pressure multiplied by volume. And we can also write this out for an infinitesimal process. That gives us dH is equal to du plus PdV plus VdP. We've seen this before already. All right. And within this equation, there's a du. Oh, change in internal energy. Another term that we are very familiar with. Let's go ahead and write our expression for that since we know that as well. Right, we said that change in internal energy is equal to change in our heat plus change in our work. And we have these dashes um, across our RD because these are path functions. All right, so we can't express it with, a, with the same way that we would express these state functions. All right, we also talked about, you know, change in work. This is equal to minus PDV, so we can insert that for DW. All right, and also for a reversible process, we had defined that DQ for a reversible process is equal to TDS. So we can go ahead and replace DQ with this term right here. And what we end up with is a relation, an, an expression for internal energy, all right, that says that change in internal energy is equal to T multiplied by DS, change in entropy, minus PDV, change in volume. And what we can go ahead and do now 
that we've kind of expressed these three thermodynamic quantities in, in various ways is start plugging things back into other things. All right, so we're going to take this expression for du and plug it in for du in our full expression of dh, change in enthalpy. All right, so that's the first thing we can do. We can replace du here with TDS minus PDV. And that's exactly what we do right here. We write that DH is now equal to TDS minus PDV plus PVD plus PDV um, plus VDP. All right, and what we notice is that this minus PDV term and this plus PDV term cancel out, and now DH is equal to TDS plus VDP. Now we can take this expression of dh and plug it back into our Gibbs energy, right? Our Gibbs energy equation, our change in Gibbs energy equation was dg equals dh minus tds minus sdt. We're going to replace dh now with tds plus vdp, and what we get is this following expression for change in Gibbs energy. It's equal to tds plus vdp minus TDS minus SDT. And what we notice is that we have a positive TDS and a negative TDS. Those cancel out. And what we get to what what we get for DG change in Gibbs energy is that it is equal to VDP volume multiplied by change in pressure minus entropy multiplied by change in temperature. Alright, so VDP minus SDT. Alright, so that is what our change in Gibbs energy is equals. Now, this relationship clearly shows how Gibbs energy depends on both pressure and temperature. And we see that the term VDP, right, VDP indicates that Gibbs energy changes with pressure, with V being the volume. And similarly, the term minus SDT indicates that Gibbs energy changes with temperature, with S being entropy. Now, Gibbs energy can also be thought of as a measure of the useful energy of a system. While the total energy, the enthalpy, includes all forms of energy, Gibbs energy specifically tells us how much energy is available to do work other than just expansion work. All right, Expansion work is the work done by a system against an external pressure, such as when a gas expands. Non-expansion work includes things like electrical work, for example, in electrochemical cells. All right. And we can look at this relationship and it can be interpreted as the work done by the system. All right. This VDP term can be interpreted as the work done by the system against a constant external pressure minus the work needed to create space for the system. All right, and so this DG term, this change in entropy, this change in Gibbs energy, represents the maximum non-expansion work that can be done by the system in a reversible process at constant temperature and constant pressure. All right, fantastic. And so, in simpler terms, really, if you have a chemical reaction that's producing a product and you want to harness the energy to do useful work, like charging a battery or turning a motor, the Gibbs energy tells you the maximum amount of work you could theoretically get from that reaction. So that is the meaning of Gibbs energy. All right? And there are many implications for real world applications here. So understanding the concept of Gibbs energy as the maximum non-expansion work is really important in fields like electrochemistry. So for example, in a galvanic cell, which is a type of battery, the Gibbs energy change of the chemical reaction occurring inside the cell is directly related to the electrical work the battery can, can do. And similarly, in industrial processes, knowing the Gibbs energy changes can help engineers and scientists optimize con conditions for maximum efficiency. And so in conclusion, really, the Gibbs energy provides a comprehensive understanding of the spontaneity of processes and the maximum non-expansion work that can be extracted from them. All right, and I really want to drive home 
the meaning of Gibbs energy with that final statement. So I hope that helps you, you know, look at this expression, delta G equals delta H minus T delta S, and begin to understand what this expression is telling us and how it is useful in many real world applications. All right, I'm going to stop the lecture here. This is part one of Gibbs Energy. In the next video, we're going to continue this lecture. Let me know if you have any questions, comments, concerns down below. Other than that, good luck, happy studying, and have a beautiful, beautiful day.